You need to do a thorough motor examination of the lower extremities to determine which nerve root may be involved. It's important to assess hip flexor strength, which is done by asking the patient to lift his hip up on the affected side and you try to push it down against the patient's resistance. This is suggestive of an L2 distribution. Test their knee extension by having the patient straighten his leg out and keep the leg up while you try to flex the knee back down. This is the quadriceps muscle and we like to use that as the L3 nerve root function. L4 nerve root function is generally assessed by having the patient dorsiflex the ankle and keep it there against resistance. L5 nerve root function is assessed by having the patient extend his big toe and testing the extensor hallucis longus against resistance. S1 nerve root function is tested either by testing the peroneal muscles for eversion of the foot and testing against resistance or by having the patient push down on your fingers and testing for strength in the gastrosoleus complex. This is often difficult to test because this is such a powerful muscle and another way to test S1 function is by having the patient do single leg toe lifts on one side and comparing that to the opposite side. Abnormal reflex function in the lower extremities may also suggest nerve root problems. The common reflex is the Achilles tendon reflex which is suggestive of S1 function and the second reflex is the knee jerk which is suggestive either of L4 or L3 nerve root function. The pathologic reflexes in myelopathy in the lower extremity are the Babinski reflex where scratching the outer border of the sole of the foot reflexly results in extension and splaying out of the toes. The normal Babinski would be a flexor response where the toes flex and come together. Other reflex changes in myelopathy are the absence of superficial reflexes. So we should test the superficial abdominal reflexes in all four quadrants. And in some cases we may need to test for absence of the cremasteric reflex to confirm the presence of spinal myelopathy. To be complete with any spine examination of the lumbar spine, we must rule out associated or primary problems with the hip joints or with peripheral circulation. I like to assess the hip joint, assess the hip by testing rotations of the hip joint. You can do that very simply by testing internal and external rotation of the hip joint in the seated position or by testing flexion of the hip by having the patient flex his hip up. You must also ensure that there is no peripheral vascular problem and it's always important to test for dorsalis pedis pulsation and the posterior tibial pulsation to ensure that vascular claudication is not mimicking lumbar radiculopathy. Another important test to carry out with the patient standing is for assessment of hip abductor function. The hip abductors may be weakened with L5 nerve root involvement or from arthritis at the hip joint. The way to do this is with the Trendelenburg test. To perform the Trendelenburg test with the patient standing, you put your fingers on the patient's pelvic brim on both sides and have the patient lift one leg off of the floor. In the normal patient, when the patient's standing on the affected side, the hip abductors on that side should be able to tilt the whole pelvis up and you'll find that this side of the pelvis rises with respect to the other side. If a patient has an abnormal Trendelenburg test, the way this would be manifest is by having the patient stand again on the abnormal side and lift the other leg up. Instead of the pelvis going up on this side, because the hip abductors are weak on the bad side,
the pelvis will tend to sag to the normal side. Examination of the gait is an important part of the overall spine examination. If you have a patient with L5 nerve deficit, they will have weakness in dorsiflexing their toes and possibly their ankle. This results in what we call a foot drop gait, where they're unable to dorsiflex their foot during the swing through phase of gait. So instead of walking with a normal heel toe pattern like this, they walk with a foot drop gait which goes like this. And their toes will tend to stub the carpet. In order to compensate for this drop foot gait, what many patients will do is raise their whole leg up a little bit higher as they swing through. So they lift their foot up and you can see that their foot stomps the ground a little harder than it normally should and it almost feels like the foot's a little floppy as they swing it through. The hip abductors are responsible for elevating the pelvis towards the side you're standing on so that you can swing through the contralateral leg when your stance phase is on this leg. So if you have weakness of the hip abductors on this side, as I swing through this leg, instead of normally being able to swing through because my pelvis is raised on the left side, the pelvis sags and the foot will again tend to drag on the floor. In order to avoid the foot dragging on the floor, what patients with hip abductor weakness on this side do is that they tilt their whole body to the affected side so that the foot can swing through a little easier. So in effect, the gait will look something like this. And we call that a Trendelenburg gait from weakness of the hip abductors on this side. Now you can have weakness of the hip abductors either from nerve deficit or from an arthritic hip or local contusion to the hip abductor muscles. Patients with cervical myelopathy don't have good proprioception, so they don't know where their feet actually contact the floor as they walk. So they subjectively feel like they're walking on clouds or walking on cotton wool. And to compensate and balance for that, they may tend to have a slightly broad-based or a slightly slower gait pattern. So if you see a broad-based pattern where patients are trying to almost seek their balance and seek their footstep, then be suspicious of a myelopathic type ataxic gait pattern. In patients with cervical myelopathy, also make sure that they don't have a Romberg's sign, which is they should be able to maintain their balance with their feet together and their eyes closed. If they start staggering around with the eyes closed, then you know that they've lost some proprioception and cervical myelopathy may be a cause. Also assess whether they can do a tightrope walk which gives you a good sense of what their proprioception and overall long tract control is like. Oftentimes people with myelopathy will be unable to walk in a heel toe fashion and will stagger or stumble when they're trying to walk in this fashion.